Okay, we are reading uh, Hands of Light by Barbara Brennan. We are on chapter 25, page number 255 of the book and page number 268 of the PDF. The Healing of David. David grew up in California. His parents were psychologists. He loved the ocean, surfing, and the sun. David received a PhD in kinesiology from the University of California and then began to teach. Later, he spent some time in India where he fell in love with another American, Anne, and also became quite ill. He and Anne returned to the US. For the next four years, his search for healing took him over the US, where he received various diagnoses from possible mononucleosis, chronic pers persistent hepatitis, and unknown viruses to it to it's all in your mind, there is nothing wrong with you. Meanwhile, his energy was decreasing rapidly and it was getting more and more difficult for him to work by the time he got to my office. His energy would be good for a day or two. Then it would disappear and he would spend a day or two in bed. David walked into my office with the energy field shown in figure 25-1. The most obvious and serious problem was in the solar plexus chakra, which was torn open and needed to be So you just show the Nietzsche wala picture. So you can see that the solar plexus is torn open in this picture. Okay, and there's clogging and congestion also on the left side of the head. Plus the lower part has got disfigured. The uh, root chakra has shifted out of place. sewn back into form on all the structured layers of the field, including the seventh. The second most important problem was the distortion of the first chakra. It was bent to the left and was clogged. This caused a lack of ability to take energy into the energy system through the base chakra. The combination of a torn third chakra that leaked energy and a clogged first chakra caused a very depleted energy system. This depletion would be strongly felt physically because the first chakra metabolizes the majority of energy association with physical strength, as discussed in chapter 11. In addition to these problems, the aura also showed a depletion and weakness in the second chakra, which is associated not only with the sexual function which was down, but also with the immune system. There is a lymphatic center located there. The heart center showed a block deep inside its vortex. It is also associated with the immune system through the thymus gland. This block was located two thirds of the way down into the spiral of the heart chakra. Whenever I have seen this configuration in people, it has been associated with an issue regarding the individual's relationship to God and his belief about what God's will is. More about that. This is important, right? The heart is where we actually connect with the God, our inner. Whenever, suppose someone asks you, where do you live? Most of the people will say in the heart. Some people will say in the head, but most of the people will, when you, when you ask to point to yourself, you will point to your heart. Right. So this is your actual internal connection with, with the divine. The throat center is associated with communication, self-responsibility and also giving and receiving. The third eye was clogged and blocked all the way deep into the head and into the pineal gland. The crown chakra was weak and undercharged. The whole aura was deflated and dull. 
Upon examining the organs, I could see a great deal of clogging and dark energy in the liver. There were layers of discoloration in the liver. One was dark, slimy green. One was an ugly yellow. And deeper inside, near the spine, there were areas that were almost black. The etheric matrix of the liver itself was torn and deformed. Upon closer inspection, I saw multiple infectious organisms, some bacterial and some viral in size and appearance. These organisms spread throughout the middle abdominal area, including the pancreas, spleen, and digestive tract. Over the pancreas, there was a small, swiftly spinning vortex making a high-pitched screeching sound. This configuration is usually associated with sugar metabolism, problems like diabetes or hypoglycemia. The overall field was undercharged and weak. Instead of nice bright streamers coming from the sixth layer, they were limp and dull. This was a very sick man. So again, you see, we don't realize it. This happens also in shamanism, where you know you, you say that there are many critters in the body. And the shaman actually goes into the body and takes out the critters and throws them out of the body system. So she's also observing that there are many critters and all that stuff, clogged energy inside the energy system. For the student of healing, I suggest that at this point, you stop reading, analyze the field and make out the healing plan that you would follow. Where would you start first? Would you use as much energy as you could possibly run into this system to charge it? Why or why not? When would you repair the seventh layer and why? What would you imagine could be the initiating cause of this illness and how does it show in the auric field? Will this be a rapid recovery or a slow one? Why? All these questions will be answered in the following description on the healing process that occurred. So there are two ways of, you know, actually going in, uh, going into doing a healing. One is to follow the paths that shows up after you've done something. And the other is to have a structured plan that this is the way that we are going to heal. Right. So both work. And both work at times and both don't work at times. So what we need to do is to understand at which time to use which process of actually doing the healing process. The healing sequence, first phase, clearing, charging and restructuring the field. For the first several weeks, healings were centered on first chelating the field straightening the first chakra and then slowly but surely repairing the problem in the third chakra area. So now what is she doing, right? The first thing is to allow energy to come into the system and that is happening from the root chakra, right? That connection has to be made proper. So that's the first thing that she is doing and also clearing out the field of the debris as much as possible. So she is chelating. Jitna kachra nikal sakte, utna nikal rahe and naya and fresh energy is being allowed into the system. This is the same thing we do in biofield also. We first settle the earth star and the sun star where we feel that the grounding and the connection with the earth energies and cosmic energies come and then we start moving into the field. Before that, moving into the field I found is useless. It doesn't work at all. I would sit sometimes for a half to three quarters of an hour with my hands on David's liver and third chakra area. It was impossible to charge the aura very strongly because of the weakness in the third chakra area. A strong energy charge would have possibility of ripping that chakra more. So again, this becomes important, right? In most cases, less is better in the healing process, in the natural healing process. You have to tone how much you are giving, right? You, If you go overboard, ki ye bhi kar lete, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. The body has to be prepared to be able to receive that energy. 
otherwise there is no point in giving the energy to the body system it was relatively easy during these weeks to straighten and clear the first chakra this was done systematically whereas most of the focus of each healing would center on the mid abdominal area repairing the tears in the auric field took a long time because the changes needed were so great the aura couldn't be charged fully because the tear in the third chakra would either tear more or certainly leak more energy if a strong charge was sent through it each time david came in we would chill it charge and repair part of the area of the third chakra put a temporary seal or bandage over the tear and let it heal for a week the next week a little more was done each week i would go deeper into the field to repair the structure of the aura first cleansing then restructuring in a step by step process it was necessary to repair the structure of the etheric level first then the etheric template level of the liver and other anatomical structures in that area as well as the chakra as the weeks wore on david's energy began to level out rather than the rapid up and down phases he stayed at an even low this did not seem like progress to him but it did to me okay so now this is very important statement that she has made it didn't seem like progress to the client but it seemed like progress to me right so what are we attempting to do here we are attempting to balance the field we are attempting to make the field run smooth right it's like we are tuning the engine of the car now some some people like like the racket in the car you know and some people want the smoothness in the run of the car the engine of the car so what she is doing she is smoothening out the engine so she is tuning the engine and in that process the 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 client is feeling that there is no progress but the system is settling down that is extremely important i could see the field slowly readjusting itself rather than the strong energy flip flops caused by his body is trying to compensate for the weakness and then not being able to maintain the compensation his energy leveled out to the actual level of his body could maintain in his condition for david this was very discouraging so right everyone has a propensity we need to level out at the level that we can manage and then step it up right raise the bar slowly david's first chakra began to hold its straightened position and the second chakra began to charge up finally he began to regain his energy and sexuality he also started to feel less vulnerable emotionally during most of david's first 3 months of healing heaven would not make comments to him heaven would simply say to me that david had had quite enough psychological or spiritual lectures and it would be rather like cosmic law jammed down his throat so this is also important right how and what to tell a person the the healer has to be very very aware of it you know because if you give an overdose then also the guy can be put off so i refrain from doing much psychodynamics in this phase of the work it was not the most important thing at this phase charging and repair were much more important the healer can only move as fast as the patient is able to move this is again important right you have to do the healing at the pace at which the patient can support the body system the energetic bodies of the patient can support <coughs> it's not about the healer it is all about the patient the finally david's field was strong enough to run enough energy through it at a high vibration 
to repair the seventh layer. Then David began to want more information. He started asking questions about the meaning of his illness in order to understand it in terms of his personal life situation. Right. So every illness that we have, or in fact, everything that happens to us happens because of a cause, right? And that cause, to understand that cause becomes an important aspect of the entire healing process. So even when I'm doing healing with biofield tuning, we are having a lot of discussion with the clients. The healing sequence, second phase, psychodynamics and some initiating causes. David's inquiry came as his third chakra, the linear mind began to function more smoothly. Slowly, a picture formed of the human level of causative factors of his illness. Every child has strong connections with the mother as discussed in chapter eight. This connection is made when the child is in the womb and after birth, that connection can be seen through the auric umbilical cord that remains between mother and child. This cord connects their third chakras. After birth, there is also a strong heart connection formed between child and mother through their heart chakras. So the parent's connection with the child, okay, and this is something that I'm, I'm seeing over and over again. If a child is not clear, if anyone is not clear and in harmony with their parents, then all sorts of jamela starts to happen in their life, right? You have to clear with your parents. That is very important because you are part of them. Their DNA has made you. You resonate with them. And if there is discord in the resonance between you and your parents, then nothing else can heal, right? Because that's your primal uh, uh, frequency. That's your primal frequency. The original tear in David's third chakra happened at a time near puberty when he rebelled from a very domineering and controlling mother. Before this time, David had done all he could to please her. Both his psychologist parents had unwittingly misused their knowledge of psychology to exert control over their son. This is another thing, right? Parents also, the child has a responsibility towards the parents, but parents also have a responsibility towards their children, right? Uh, managing a child and the growth of a child is the prime duty of any parent. You can't unnecessarily force a child. You, you have to give the child a balance between freedom and boundaries, right? You have to create the boundaries. But within the boundaries, you need to give freedom to the children. And most parent, if they're, parents, if they're dominating, then they will want to guide every and each aspect of whatever is happening with the child, which can really create problems for children. Going forward, they will rebel. I'm getting a lot of people now with uh, children the age of 23, 25 and you know they're having huge issues. They won't listen to their parents. This is the basic reason where in the beginning the parents were overbearing and over dominating and now the child has said once the child has grown up, become an adult that I'm not going to listen to you anymore. So you know we have to be very careful with this. David's solution to gain autonomy was like that of many teenagers. He broke ties with his parents. Unfortunately, the only way he knew how to do this was literally to break the tie that bound him to his mother. He was left with loose auric umbilical cords and a hole in the solar plexus area. Of course, the most natural thing to do is to find someone else with whom to connect and thereby to replace mother. At this stage, everyone thinks the problem is mother's, not oneself. Unfortunately, he discovered that he kept connecting with women who were controlling. His energy system would automatically attract someone who was controlling simply because that is the kind of energy David was used to being connected to. That is what felt like normal to him. Like attracts like. These unsatisfactory relationships led him on a search for himself 
and eventually to an ashram in India. He began to see that problem was inside himself. So what are we resonating with, right? That is what we will notice. That is what we will attract to ourselves. That's why it's so important, you know, when we are doing the advanced programs, it becomes so important to watch our thoughts. What are we thinking? What is our inner weather pattern? And whatever is the pattern that we are, uh, you know, focusing on internally, that is what we are going to attract to our life. So we have to be very careful about what we are thinking and what we are doing. On the heart level, David's fourth chakra never really connected strongly to his mother's. She had, from the beginning, not accepted who he was. When he did connect to her with his heart, he found it necessary to become the person she wanted him to be. That meant self-betrayal. David felt betrayal in his heart. Every young man has a plight of the heart. Although he strongly connects through his heart to his mother, he must eventually learn to transfer that to his mate so that he can become a full man with sexual potency, an experience he can never have with his first love, his mother. If he does not connect to the heart of his mother, then he has no model for doing so when it is time to find a mate and will have a difficult time loving. So I, <clears throat> I'm actually working with uh, a person who is exactly like this. I can't, I mean, this is exactly what is being described here. The guy doesn't have any connection with his mother. The mother literally rejected him on birth. It came out today in the biofield tuning actually, that he was born, I mean, he has a dark skin color. And because of that, he was rejected, right? So no connection with the mother, right? And naturally, because there was no connection with the mother, even with his wife, there's a aloof kind of a relationship that he is going through. And there is no connection. Today, literally, he's a like a 47-year-old man. He was actually weeping because it touched a chord. When we talked about this in his timeline, it touched a chord in his heart and he literally started weeping because he was feeling this loneliness, that lack of connection, that lack of feeling with someone else. And it starts with the mother. If there is no connection there, you're not connected with anything else, right? That becomes so important in this case. Yes, Renuji, you want to say something? Uh, where can it ever happen? I mean, I'm surprised with a mother. You know, you could think of a connection not being with somebody uh, else, but with a mother, does it, it, does, so it can if happen? The, if the mother is in a very traumatic situation when the child is born, right? Or when the child is in uh, utero. Okay, the mother is going through a lot of shitty and messy stuff. Then the connection with the child, bonding with the child may not happen. That's why, that's why you know, in olden times, breastfeeding was so important. Because the, the child was bound to the mother. That con deep connection was made. And this is something that we read in Magical Child also, right? That the connection mm -hmm. between the mother and the child, that is the first matrix that you are, the first matrix, of course, is the womb. The second mm -hmm. matrix is the mother. Now, mm -hmm. if I'm disconnected from the mother or the mother is mm -hmm. paying attention to something else, then naturally that connection doesn't happen. And through the child's life, unless it is repaired, they will have a problem with the opposite sex or with any mother figure. Bhaiya, I wanted to... May I speak? Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I wanted to give you a, an example we have mm. within our children who we look after as thalassemia. Mm. And there, he was, poor chap, he's a young child. He was rejected. In fact, the other day I was thinking what he must be going through because he's been rejected by the father. So yeah. the mother had to send him away. And mm. he's... Now with a grandmother, the nani, who is, who's not in a position financially to look after him. Yeah. So he's, he's really looking after himself at mm. the age of maybe 10, 12, mm. uh, dealing with his own problem because, you know, she is not educated. She cannot ring up. What I'm trying to say that I can, 
exactly what I felt the other day when I was talking to this boy that mm. what he must be going through being rejected by his own mother. Yeah. The mother had no alternative but to send him away because the father would not accept them. Yeah. So this happens, absolutely. This happens. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to share that this ha can happen, you know, without the mother really wanting to do it. Correct, absolutely. 101%. Yeah. There's another case we're working with. This uh, girl was adopted, right? Mm. And I know that she has a lot of, you know, stress regarding her birth mother. But when we were doing the uh, tuning, it really turned out that the mother's heart was really paining when she was giving the child up for adoption. Right now, the in the child's mind, why did my mother give me up? What was the reason? Why couldn't she look after me? These are the questions that will come up, right? But then, when when uh, when from an adult perspective, you come to understand that there were certain circumstances that my mother went through because yeah. of that this happened. You can forgive yeah. your mother, yeah, and that will repair your bond with your mother. Yeah, but you have to genuinely forgive your mother. Yeah. Thank you. David's problem in relationship was also one of not knowing how to connect with love through the heart. This brought him to India, to a guru who, in David's words, had one big heart. Through this ashram experience, David learned how to make the heart connection. First with his guru, and then with Anne, who he met there. However, he found that when connecting through the heart to his guru, he also little by little gave up his will. He was trying to learn unconditional love, but conditions set in. As David gave up his will, he began again to feel betrayed. But this time, the issue was not just loving another human being, but loving humanity and loving God. The issue was now revealed in the form of David's will versus God's will. This showed in the heart configuration in the auric field. David had found that now that he was no longer a good boy for mom, he was being a good boy for the guru and God. So This is again, you know, when we put up a facade, we immediately go into a control drama. This, this, that control drama we read in Celestine Prophecies, right? Now, if we are operating from a control drama, it will put you on the left side of the grid, which is never a good thing. You'll get depleted and at some point in time, you're going to have to get out of it, which is exactly what is happening to David right now. He and Anne decided to leave. And another tear in the third chakra was experienced when breaking away from the Guru. But he had gained the use of his heart. For the first time in his life, he was deeply connected to a woman from the heart, as well as through the solar plexus chakra. The search for acceptance and perfect love is very strong in the human soul and will lead it through many lessons. I have found that people who spent years living in a spiritual community in the 70s learned to open up their hearts, but slowly gave up a lot of autonomy, just as they did in childhood. Many found it helpful to experience profound love within the confines of a structured community before they could bring it out into the world on their own. This is especially true if it was not experienced in the childhood home. After having experienced love in a community and having unfortunately given up some of their free will to do so, they need now to hold that love in the heart and to surrender to God's will as manifested within their own heart, not to someone else's definition of God's will. Right, so you have to find your own path. There were these, uh, <clears throat> there were these uh, residents of an ashram who had attended one of our excursion workshops. I don't know how, um, I think most of you have done excursion, right? And then when we came to the one bread technique and we were looking for answers for ourselves, they turned out and said, how can we look for answers for ourselves? Only our guru can give us answers. Now that's, that's in, I mean, that raises a red flag for me right there and then, right? So this is what is happening, that you are, 
defining God's will through another person's perspective, which is something that is not possible. You have to connect with that divine will at, on your own terms, on your own processes, in your with your own perception. Yes, you can take guidance from someone, but ultimately it has to become your own connection. It cannot be through someone else, right? So that becomes extremely important. As David's healing progressed, problems in his relationship with his girlfriend that were chronic becoming became intolerable to David. He was changing in ways that were not compatible to his mate's vibrations because she did not change in the same way. Their feels no longer pulsed in harmony. So again, this is something which happens to all of us. When we change our frequency, when we change the way that we are pulsing, the way that we are vibrating, stuff which is not in resonance with that will drop off from our life. This is something that everyone experiences when you are on the spiritual path. Stuff which is not relevant will simply drop out. There's no other way for it. Yes, Renuji? Bhaiya, can you give an example of that? For example, the that? friends group, right? When you start raising your vibratory frequency, you will find that you are not interested in the talk that some of your friends are having all the oh, time. Oh, okay, okay. 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 So now naturally, if you're not interested in the conversation, then you're not going to have a good time when you're with the group. Yeah. Right. So naturally, okay. that group will slowly you'll start going less to that group. So automatically, your relationship will drop off from that group. Right, 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 right. Yes, Got so it. Shifts, Thank you. Shifts automatically start taking place. Okay. Thank you. Anyone in a long-term relationship knows this phenomenon. If you change and your mate does not change at the same rate, there is a time period when the two wonder who it is they are living with. Will the other change and be compatible this is usually possible if both live with patience and love. If not, eventually one will move on. David and Anne began to work together to solve their problems. With a great deal of love and sincerity, they focused primarily on the psychodynamics of the situation. David's main interest had turned to his work, his freedom, and gaining his own personal power. Anne, however, wanted to continue following her guru and to build a different kind of life. So again, as your vibratory frequencies change, your focus of attention changes. The way that you're living life will change, right? And naturally, if there's no compatibility, no interest in what everyone is, each of the couple is doing, then automatically a breakdown takes place. This is something which is very natural, right? If you're not happy, then what's the point of it at the end of it? Of course, if you have love and patience and you understand each other, then it is possible to repair and, you know, to sustain it. But if that is not there, then it becomes a problem. Shivangla, I'm not being able to unmute you. She's frozen up. See, another thing I've seen when we are, uh, when we, uh, she's locked out. So, Another thing I'm, I've been seeing that, you know, when we are uh, connected with someone, cords of light actually come out from the chakras and they connect in each chakra. Like they're talking about over here that first, you know, that umbilical cord has to come and connect and then it connects from the heart. There's a connection actually from all the chakras when you're associated with anyone. And if th those connections are not there, then the uh, the relationship will not progress further. I've seen this over and over with people. When they are not compatible, we check with the axis, with the antenna also. If the compatibility is not there, then it becomes very difficult to sustain the relationship. Okay, Shimangla has just checked out. Anyone, anything to add?
in addition to the cords that grow between mother and child, people in relationships grow cords of energy between each other. These are connected through the chakras. In so, a health. So, this is exactly what I just told you, right? That cords grow from each chakra to the other chakra, and we can actually see whether that connection is there or not. In a healthy relationship, these cords are clear, bright gold, balanced and connected through most of the chakras. In a lot of relationships, these cords simply repeat the unhealthy connections that were there from childhood between parent and child. Many of these cords connect in the solar plexuses and are dark in color. During the process of transforming a relationship from unhealthy to healthy, the unhealthy cords must be disconnected, energized, and reconnected deep into the individual's own cord. So now she is talking about the healing process, right? Where you remove the cord, which is not transmuting correct kind of energy, and then repair it, heal it, and then reconnect it. They are cords of dependency that must be rooted back into the individual so that he can rely upon himself. David and his friend slowly disconnected their dependent cords. This is a very scary process. The personal feeling sometimes is as if one is floating in space, not connected to anything. In doing this, one leaves the illusory safety of rigidity and replaces it with a flexible self-reliance. So again, becomes, this becomes extremely important, right? What are we all actually uh, looking for is to be self-reliant, to be able to stand on our own feet, to be able to do things in a way which is, which is good for us, right? Any kind of dependent relationship will immediately take you into a control drama, right? Over here, they were talking about the relationship with the guru, so the, they, were, they were playing a control drama with the guru. They were like the poor me and the guru only can give them what they want, right? Now, as soon as they became self-reliant, that poor me attitude is gone. Now, the guru cannot control the person anymore. So he has healed and he wants to stand on his own feet. He is not in a dependent relationship anymore. If you have ever gone through a divorce or the death of a mate, you will understand this phenomenon. Many people refer to their spouses as their better half. I have heard bereaved people speak of feeling torn apart or of losing their better half. In such a serious trauma, one feels as if one's whole front has been torn off. This is literally true. Many times I see those threads from the solar plexus dangling about in space after such a painful separation. Right. So now one, if, if, if this process of separation is not done in a gentle and a nice manner, it is literally like ripping away these cords from the self. And actually that leaves a person very, very disoriented. Right. So that's why maintaining our own homeostasis, maintaining our own inner balance becomes so important for us. The healing sequence, third phase, transformative substances. As David took his power back, he took more of an active role in the healings. He began to ask Heyun very specific questions. He asked Heyun what physical treatment he should be taking. I could still see the microorganisms in David's mid-abdominal area. He needed something. David had heard of a serum from Canada that helped people with debilitating diseases. Should he take that? No, Ewan answered. Well, it might help a little, but there is another drug that would be powerful. Ewan told me it was related to what is used in the treatment of malaria like quinine. Then Huyen showed me a picture of a swimming pool and said the first part of the word was chlorine, as in a swimming pool. 
the drug's name was like chlorine quinine, chloroquine. Hewen said that if David took that drug, it would act to wash the liver clean. He showed me a picture of David's liver being washed clear with a silvery liquid. So again, when she's saying that the picture was shown, it was shown in her mind's eye that if I go through this treatment, this is what will affect or this is what will happen. Hayun then added that David could get this drug from a doctor in the New York area where we lived. Hayun also stated that David should not take a standard dosage, but should, take var should vary the dosage according to his needs, checking every day to see what he needed by using his high sense perception and a pendulum. So again, intuition, right? Downloads. Hayun is giving downloads to uh, David through Barbara, right? So this again becomes important. Which medicine will work for me? Which will not work for me? We can actually test for this. We can actually sense this. If we take a medicine in our hand and we, when we uh, connect with our sensitivity, you will find your breath will change. The saliva in your mouth will change. Using that, you can actually figure out which drug is good for you, which is not good for you. At what dosage it is good for you. The same drug taken 1 mg is good for you, 2 mg is not good for you. So how do you adjust that, right? It becomes very important for us to be able to assess it if we really want to go to that level. David began his search. I was stunned when he came back to my office the next week with some chloroquine. I had never heard of it. David had asked a doctor if he had ever heard of a drug like the one Ewan had described. The doctor immediately took a book down from the shelf, describing the uses of chloroquine. It was used in some cases of chronic persistent. Hepatitis like David had. Since the doctor's diagnosis agreed with Ewan's, he prescribed chloroquine in the normal dosages. David began taking the drug and checking the dosage with his pendulum on a daily basis. The first five days on the drug affected David strongly, not only physically, but also emotionally. He went into depths of emotional agony. He experienced his problems described earlier very strongly. He described one day's experience as having spent the day burrowing into his girlfriend's belly. He knew it was a cleansing. He wanted to re-experience the feelings in order to heal himself. After five days, he stopped the chloroquine as his pendulum reading suggested. He even told David to take cleansing teas and vitamins for a week or two after the first bout with the chloroquine. I could see from the auric field that after taking the drug for five days, David's colon, slimy yellow-brown, was clogging up from the discharge of toxins as he cleared his infections. Cleansing teas were needed. After several days off the chloroquine, David read with the pendulum that it is time to go back on it again. He did. He would be on it for several days, then off for several. Each time he took it, he would sink into another layer of his personality that needed clearing. Each time he did so, he would come out stronger, more alive and more powerful. Each time he took it, more of the microorganism cleared from his body and his aura grew brighter and fuller. He was truly transforming himself. At times, Hewens would suggest another vitamin or cell salt like ferrum phosphate, iron phosphate to help the healing along. So again, so intuition, right? Downloads, guidance is a very, very important part of all healing processes. If we think from the ego mind that we are doing everything, that in my view is a fallacy, right? We have to step out of that ego mind to really allow healing to take through us.
I asked Huon why he had not mentioned the chloroquine earlier. He said that David's field was so damaged that he would not have been able to stand the strong effects of the chloroquine until the repair was completed. So what does this show, right? That a medicine, again, time, place and person, these three factors become very important. How much to take, where to take and how to take, right? Now the same medicine, if taken in improper doses or taken in the improper time, will not give the results that are required. So this is something, again, we need to tap into our intuition to be able to actually figure this out. During the second phase of healing, when David began dealing with psychodynamics, he and Anne broke up several times. They had been together over a decade and had a lot to clear up between them. Slowly, they got further and further apart and finally separated. From the auric point of view, since David's solar plexus chakra was no longer torn and his auric field was so brightly charged, he was no longer compatible in vibrations with his old mate. Her choice was to change in another way, to walk her own path and to create her own new life. So again, in com compatibility with the vibratory frequency. If this happens, then a disconnection automatically takes place. It results in a separation. As D David regained his power, he started dealing with his relationship to God and God's will. He began to meditate to find God's will within himself. As he did this, he began to clear the deep holding within his heart chakra. He began to surrender to his own heart. Emmanuel has said, Willing a release makes the release tighter because it does not yield to will. It yields to yielding. This is very important, right? It has to happen in a natural way. If we force these things, then it doesn't work. The final lesson for each soul is the total surrender to God's will manifest in your own heart. So we are a ansh, we are a part of God, right? So our will technically should be God's will. But when the ego comes into the picture, we deviate from that path, right? So getting into the flow, allowing things to happen rather than forcing it, Getting into effortlessness rather than effortfulness is where the shift actually starts to come. Sometime soon after David met a woman and started a relationship. This relationship was very supportive and nurturing to him. As I read the relationship for David, I could see him being soothed by the field of his new partner. It was as if the effect of her company alone expanded his auric field, whereas previously he had always contracted his field in the presence of the person he was in a relationship with. So this is a very classic example of the magnet thing that we keep using. If I'm putting pushing north and north together, the fields will contract. If I turn the magnet and it becomes north and south, the field will expand. So if I'm in a relationship with someone who resonates with me, who is in tune with what is happening, right? Automatically the field will grow. If the resonance is not there and there's always conflict going on, then the resonance will discharge. It will create a problem for both the, uh, both the couples. You can finish this chapter. The healing sequence, fourth phase, transmutation and rebirth. During the last month that I worked with David, I began to see a configuration within his field that I had never seen before. It appeared to be uncovered by the work we had done. It looked like a cocoon surrounding the spine. It is difficult for me to say which level of the field it was on but it appeared that this cocoon held a lot of dormant energy waiting to be tapped. 
I didn't speak to David about this cocoon, but quietly watched it as I worked primarily on clearing the sixth chakra. All the rest of the aura was clear and bright. David came to his last session looking very different. His aura was twice as bright and much larger than usual. The cocoon had opened. I asked what had happened to him. He said that he had taken a drug popularly called ecstasy or MDMA, a synthetic drug of the phenylethylamine class synthesized from methamphetamine and a saffron over the weekend. Upon closer inspection, I could see that the MDMA had opened the left side of the pineal gland. The mucus from the third eye that had been placed there partially from doing pot and LSD was cleared away on the right side. There was still work to be done, but the overall change in David's field was amazing. So again, some drugs can also work well, right? But you have to again... Use higher sense perception, testing whether it's really good for you or not. Since my observations had always shown psychotrophic drugs to have a negative effect on the aura, I asked Hewan about it. He said, that depends on who takes it and what their field configuration is at the time of taking it. Since David's sixth chakra was clogged and it was time for him, to work on opening it, the drug had a strong effect. But if the individual involved needed to focus on a different chakra, the effect would most likely be negative. So again, the same thing can be negative for someone and positive for someone else. So depleting for someone and uplifting for someone else. That's why we have to be very specific in whatever we are doing when we do healing. One size doesn't fit all. When a different patient asked if she could take MDMA, Hewan said, no, I would not recommend it for you. Rather take overtrophine to strengthen your second chakra where you need to work. Overtrophine is made of freeze-dried beef ovaries. She took overtrophine and had experiences similar to those David had when he took chloroquine. Hewan wishes to emphasize that the new medicine deals on all levels to heal the whole person. It focuses on the soul's destiny as the main issue. What lesson is being learned and how can the individual best learn that lesson? Ultimately, the lesson is that you are a spark of the divine. The more you remember that, the closer to home you get. So that is the basic premise, right? That how do we connect to that divine, that divinity that is there within us? That is the task that all of us ultimately have. So Nagarji keeps saying jago or bhago, right? What, what does that mean, right? That we need to start becoming aware of the direction that we need to go in and then follow that path. Nagarji is here today. Drugs can be used as transformative substances that is their purpose. They do not cure the disease. They assist the individual to cure himself. The precise substance in the precise amount at the precise times assists the individual to transform himself. So again, very, very clearly, he has said the precise amount at the precise time for the precise individual, right? So again, Nothing fits everyone. One size doesn't fit all. David asked Ewan a lot of questions during our last meeting. What was revealed about his changing and the meaning of the cocoon was encouraging for all of us to hear. David asked what had happened to him about a month earlier when he began to feel a deep, profound change within himself that seemed permanent. That's when I had started to see the cocoon. At that time, he began to feel he had control over his life that was beginning to turn out the way he wanted it. He had a beautiful relationship and he decided to move to the West Coast. Hewan said 
that one month ago, David had actually completed his incarnation. David had started the last round of completion six years previously when he went to India. That was the last cycle of this lifetime in which he had chosen to incarnate to open his heart. One month ago, he had actually completed that task. He at that time was free to leave, but had chosen not to do so, but to reincarnate in the same body. So this is classic walk-in, right? Where you decide to relive. So you are using this body as a vehicle to experience the experience again. Now, many times this also happens that one soul doesn't want to live in this body anymore and another soul can actually walk in. So this is a beautiful description, description of being reborn. Haven said that the next three years would be spent integrating two levels. You missed a paragraph. He even said that future lifetimes were laid down into the field before birth and could be taken on at the completion of a life if the individual so chose. This could be done without leaving the body. Think of how much more efficient it is, Haven said. The cocoon energy manifest around David's spine was the energy consciousness of the life he was about to begin. Haven said, that the next three years would be spent integrating two levels of his being into one. And that would take some getting used to. He would have much more energy and much more knowledge available to him as he integrated this energy into his reality. Haven suggested that if David wished, he could change his name. Haven added that the future did not have to be like the past. Here is part of one of their dialogues. So again, integration, right? You'll find that many people after a spiritual experience, they totally transform. Their nature changes, right? And that's what, uh, you know, the deep shifts take place. We'll complete the chapter. David, what does it mean to reincarnate with the same body? Heaven, in a sense, and here we must use metaphor, you sit down with your spirit guides before birth and choose your parents, choose a set of probable realities, choose work to do, and choose a set of energies that will then build a body. You, in a sense, separate a portion of your greater being that take that consciousness and create a body with it. You choose your parents and the physical inherited qualities gained from them. So again, this is very clear, right? In everywhere we are experiencing that we actually choose what we want to experience. And because of that, we choose our parents. We, we choose the epigenetic genetical environment that we will be born in. You sit down and you choose all that for a specific purpose. If in a particular lifetime you complete that purpose and reach a certain goal, then it is always very easy to add another lifetime. You simply interweave the new consciousness that would be used in the next body into the old body and consciousness. So the game is about completing our mission. What was the mission that we set for ourselves? If we complete it quickly, then we can integrate it and move on and create another thing. This is something that I've seen in a number of people where they totally shift focus. They shift the direction of life. What is happening in their life and they integrate into another kind of a life. So you have done your work well and as you fuse your new consciousness within the old body, you will find many changes occurring for you are now integrating the two. David, they already are. Heyoen, absolutely. Isn't it a wonderful thing when you die or we prefer to say leave or drop the body and no longer need the body as a tool for transformation 
transmutation and transcendence, you will no longer create one. The body is a tool, a vehicle that you have created to focus on certain points within the self that you wish to transform in a most efficient way. All of the systems in your body are built precisely for that transformation. You will see that in your work in the nervous system, in the automatic functioning of the body down to the very cells of the bones. You will find each portion of the body a delicate and beautiful tool for the use of transformation. It is not a burden, it is a gift. It is unfortunate that most human beings do not understand that. So what does this mean, right? The, the body is a vehicle for I'm us. I'm just to... coming in a minute. The body is a vehicle which allows us to grow, right? It is a tool that we need to use for various purposes, right? If we treat it as a burden, then it becomes an issue and a problem. But the most important thing here is that we actually decide what we want to achieve and do in this life. But what comes in the way is the ego self, right? In the bigger consciousness with the big guy, we actually know what our life path is. We have decided it. But when we start saying no and bring the ego into the picture, not you know allowing ease into our life to allow things to happen rather than forcing them to happen, that is when things start going wrong. If we look back in our lives, you know, the most wonderful things that have happened in our lives have happened spontaneously. There's not something that you've really worked on. It simply just happens and we have allowed it to happen. That's when the real shifts also actually take place in our life. Uh, what do you mean by uh, transformation and integration? Like uh, integrate? So, so now let's say someone has a near-death experience. Okay. Now that person has gone into an altered state of consciousness and actually seen something out there. And that is real to that person. Previously, that person did not even have any information or knowledge about it and did not believe that such a thing could happen. Now, when that person comes back, don't you think the life will change? Anything new that you experience, which you previously had not even thought of, will create a shift in your life. Like that over here, what he is talking about is, or she, uh, Heon is talking about, is that there was a personality, there was a soul, right? The soul had decided, I want to do A, B, C, D. Now, A, B, C, D is over. Now, the soul decides that, okay, I will use the same vehicle, the same body to complete E, D, E, F also. Basically, that's the game. And that needs to be integrated because A, B, C, D is still there. And E, G, F has again come in. So they need to integrate the whole. Does that answer your question, Nidhi? Uh -huh. uh, yes. Uh, is there any kind of uh, example, like real life example? See, I'll tell you, most of the people who go through a near-death experience or a spiritual experience, they start becoming more giving. They become more, much calmer and cooler. They, uh, they, they, you know, they don't treat life events so seriously as they used to treat previously. I mean, I'm just naming, there's a list of 16 transformations that actually take place. You don't experience all 16 of them. You experience maybe five or six of them in your life. So that shift starts to take place. Yeah, yes. Okay. In your body are built precisely for that transformation. You will see that in your work in the nervous system, in the automatic functioning of the body, down to the very cells of the bones. You will find each portion of the body a delicate and beautiful tool for the use of transformation. It is not a burden. It is a gift. It is unfortunate that most human beings do not understand that. If again, we use the metaphor of sitting down at the conference table with us to choose your life, then you, the greater portion of you that is not completely incarnated, and we must say that you couldn't possibly do that anyway. That greater portion of you decides whether or not the best place for you for the next transformative work is in a body or not. 
and when you have made full use of these physical vehicles whichever one it may be that is when you end the round of life and death as it is called or the wheel of incarnations on the physical plane it simply is that you no longer need the, this tool to separate out a linear time and a three dimensional space that makes it easier for you to see that particular points that you wish to transform it is at that point where you decide you the greater you and you are a great soul much greater than that small portion that is incarnated you then decide whether or not it is shall we say profitable to utilize the physical body it is more or less like picking up a hoe or a rake does the garden still need to be raked if so why not do it with a rake rather than the hand say so again we take a decision right whether it is we can continue here or not provided you get into that higher sensory perception state of consciousness that's why accessing higher states of consciousness becomes so important and that is the beauty of the monroe process it allows you to go into those states very easily gently and in a very integrated kind of a way that's why i'm i really tell people that you know you must to the gateway voyage at least david and after one finishes his rounds of incarnation on the physical plane heaven then enlightenment goes on in another way we are we also are clearing ourselves and moving towards god there are an infinite number of stages for if you were to be carried from one level of reality to the next to the next you would go into an infinite space at this point you can only go to a certain height because your perception ability is not that broad the more enlightened one gets the broader the perception there is really no end to it healing on the higher levels becomes creativity so again there is no end to growth there is no end to spiritual evolution and in the higher states of consciousness of course creativity is there everywhere it's here also how creative can you get while you are using your healing tools how creative can you get when you are cooking right how creative can you get when you are making a bed so everything requires creativity your physical reality is now in transition into the next phase where transformation will no longer focus on pain future transformation and healing will encompass movement music and art in a creative way healing turns into creativity as one moves into the light and holds it within as the darkness fades the transformation process becomes one of creativity rather than of healing so beautiful right transformation becomes a process of healing of creativity rather than healing now if we are constantly saying no if we are not in the flow then pain will come to make us pay attention but if we are in the flow then you automatically start becoming more creative the downloads start happening the more you act on the downloads the better off you automatically start to become so our thing is to start saying yes to what the universe is bringing into our life the moment we start saying yes rather than creating a block we will find stuff will start to move for us this is something that i'm experiencing tremendously in my life right now i literally do i mean i won't say don't but i avoid saying no if something comes up yes how can it be fitted into the system how can we make it work that is the question that personally i am constantly looking for i think we can stop here we've over short time Our apologies for that but we just finished this chapter shivangla you can stop it you're muted stop the recording